so I have to say this is one of the uh, highlights of the meeting for me, the opportunity to introduce our historical lecturer this morning. Um, Dr. David Narwald uh, was for many years the Loyal and Edith Davis Professor and Chairman of the Department of Surgery at Northwestern University. Um, he uh, is a clinical uh, expert in GI surgery, uh, had uh, uh, significant research uh, contributions over many years. Um, Dr. Narwald has, you know, a long list of accomplishments. I, I won't read them all because then he won't have time to talk, but I do want to note that uh, Dr. Narwald was a director and chair of the American Board of Surgery, uh, president of the American Board of Medical Specialties, chairman of the board of the Joint Commission. Um, he is the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award of the American College of Surgeons, the John P. Hubbard Award of the National Board of Medical Examiners, the Derek Vale Award of the American Board of Medical Specialties, and the Distinguished Alumni Award of Indiana University School of Medicine. Um, in his retirement, Dr. Uh, Narwald has been uh, busier than many of us are in our uh, uh, careers. Uh, he uh, has co-written uh, a book of the centennial history of the American College of Surgeons um, and recently wrote uh, a, this new book, A Mirror Reflecting Surgery, Surgeons and Their College, um, about the bullets in the American College of Surgeons. Um, I have to say that for me, uh, Dr. Narwald will always be the boss, and um, there, I think, are a few uh, opportunities to be able to acknowledge a single person who has had such a tremendous impact on uh, one's career, and for that I am very appreciative of, of uh, Dr. Narwald's impact on my career. Uh, he hired me as a resident when I'm pretty sure that I didn't deserve to get into the program. Uh, he made it possible for me to finish my PhD in philosophy when I was convinced that I shouldn't finish it. Um, and he made it possible for me to do a fellowship in endocrine surgery at the University of Michigan, for which I'm very grateful. And last but not least, he hired me as a faculty member at Northwestern University uh, and so was a, a real influence on my career in many, many ways. So it is uh, my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, a true mentor to me and my good friend, Dr. David Narwald. Thank you, Peter. He's always been given to hyperbole, I know that. An interesting thing happens uh, as uh, in our profession as we get older. Uh, Peter would describe me uh, as his teacher and I was his student. But as time goes on, uh, I have become his student and he has become my teacher. And that is as it should be. Well, it is said that uh, one becomes interested in history as one is about to become history. <laughs> and I'm no exception to that adage. Uh, the, um, that's not the right one. Oh, there you go. Here we go. The American College of Surgeons will be 105 years old this year. I've spent about the last 10 years rooting around in its history and have learned to my surprise that the college in, the, in its early days created the system of health care that we still use. Of course, modifications and improvements have been made, but the college established hospitals as the center of our health care system and it determined the role of doctors in hospitals. The college ex established the process by which doctors take care of patients and how clinical research could be done, facilitating huge advances in medicine and surgical care. 
Finally, the college defined the qualifications of a surgeon, effectively determining what a surgeon was and still is. These fundamental achievements were made by a group of surgeons, private citizens, who had organized themselves in a, in a not-for-profit organization dedicated to the ethical and competent practice of surgery, the American College of Surgeons. The man responsible for founding the college was Dr. Franklin Martin, a gynecologic surgeon who was born in 1857 and grew up on a farm in southeastern Wisconsin near Oconomowoc. Like many young men and women of the time, he taught in a country school for a while, then served as an apprentice to a physician, and eventually went to medical school at Northwestern in Chicago, graduating in 1880. After two years of internship at Mercy Hospital in Chicago, he practiced surgery there. Most of his contemporaries had graduated from proprietary schools that provided little, if any, clinical experience. Only a few graduates were able to obtain an internship, and there were no residencies. Martin was appalled by the general incompetence of physicians and the disgusting conditions in hospitals, many of which were simply homes converted into makeshift hospitals for destitute people. This photograph was taken in 1902. These guys circumvented the arguments about wearing skull caps, hoods, or bonnets by wearing nothing on their heads. There's an apparatus here for dripping ether, and I'm not sure what they are doing or what they're going to do, but it looks as if whatever it is will result in an infection. Martin founded the journal Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics in 1905, now, of course, the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. And in 1910, he started the annual Clinical Congress of North America in Chicago, in which surgeons and would-be surgeons were invited to watch competent surgeons operate in their hospitals. By the third year, 3,000 people attended and the surgical leaders took notice of Martin and his exceptional organizational talent. In 1912, he engineered the founding of the American College of Surgeons. A few years later, his Clinical Congress of North America was folded into the Clinical Congress of the college at its annual meetings, beginning many years of attendees observing surgery eventually through closed-circuit television until the concern about malpractice suits uh, shut that down. College leaders focused on setting standards for membership in the college, and by doing so, they defined for the first time the qualifications for being a surgeon. Candidates for fellowship had to have graduated from an approved medical school and serve at least one year as an intern. Remember, there were no residencies. So two years as a surgical assistant or another, to another surgeon or a so-called surgeon was required, followed by five to eight years in clinical practice. Then as now, candidates had to sign a pledge against fee splitting. If the candidate worked in a city with a population of fewer than 50,000 people, 50% 50 of his or her practice had to be in surgery. Whereas if the candidate worked in a city of more than 50,000, 80% of the practice had to be in surgery. The college recognized that fellows in smaller communities had to do general practice to survive, so that they might be, and they, they might be the only physician in the community and have to care for all of the community's medical needs. The practice of admission, uh, the process of admission the fellowship also included an application attesting that these qualifications had been met, plus the submission of 50 surgical cases in detail and 50 in abstract form. A central college uh, committee reviewed the cases, and a regional committee 
often examine the candidate orally, sometimes basing the examination on the candidate's admitted case, submitted cases. Martin was a marketing genius. He uh, courted new fellows by making announcements about the college and its meetings in his journal, SGNO. He also issued this book to every member of the college. In it were the names of the fellows, their addresses, and their hospital and university appointments. And it also contained the names of the officers and regents, the bylaws, the names of the founders, a historical sketch of the college, and the fellowship pledge. It explained the process for becoming a fellow. Martin put this book out every three years and distributed it to hospital administrators and officials of other medical organizations. Beginning in the 1930s, the directory was also distributed to lay groups and libraries, as well as companies that made medical equipment and supplies. It was the first of the best doctor books. Martin began publishing the Bulletin of the American College of Surgeons in 1916. It was distributed to all fellows, to hospital administrators, and to libraries. For many years, its main focus was the hospital standardization program, publishing the talks given at the annual hospital standardization conferences and the many annual regional conferences. By 1914, the regents agreed to hire a director of the college. Given the role of the college in educating surgeons, Martin felt strongly that the director should be an educator. So the regents considered two individuals, Charles Van Hise, president of the University of Wisconsin, and John Bowman, president of the University of Iowa that the presidents of two major universities would consider leaving their jobs for the directorship of the college was a measure of the national importance of the college and what it planned to do. These men understood the impact the college would have on the nation's health care system. Bowman accepted the position and immediately marketed the college to boards of trustees of hospitals and lay groups throughout the country as a fellowship of surgeons and an educational organization that gave a diploma to each fellow, indicating that the individual was a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Surgeons displayed the diploma in their offices and used the appellation FACS on their stationery. It was good for business. The case histories for, for that applicants for fellowships submitted revealed major deficiencies in the hospitals in which <clears throat> applicants performed surgery. Bowman became convinced that hospitals needed to meet standards, and he traveled the country to garner support from hospital administrators and trustees for this concept. <clears throat> A major coup was enlisting the support of Father Charles Moulinier, president of the Catholic Hospital Association because about half of the hospital beds in the country at that time were in Catholic hospitals, and Moulinier delivered all of them. After Bowman reviewed the results of the questionnaire he had sent to hospitals asking about their facilities and procedures, he held a meeting with 60 hospital superintendents in 1917 to discuss standards that he had proposed. This was the first of the annual meetings held by the college on hospital standardization. Bowman's proposed standards were, were refined and adopted in 1918, and the first surveys were done immediately thereafter, measuring the hospitals against the college's five minimum standards. The first standard set physicians apart from other hospital personnel in effect, creating a medical staff organization within a larger organization, the hospital. This organization determined how physicians were to function inside the hospital and effectively excluded non-physicians from determining the role of physicians. Physicians could vote on matters of importance and goad the hospital administration into into creating policies for patient care, 
and purchasing the latest equipment and supplies. The medical staff organization still exists, despite many efforts of hospital administrators to gain control over it. By hiring physicians and making them employees, hospitals have gained partial control over their activities and have made moot some of the protections the medical staff organization provided for, for, for physicians. The medical staff is to be restricted to physicians who are competent and worthy in character and medical ethics. The importance of this standards was its implication that the medical staff can set criteria for membership on the medical staff. These criteria allow the medical staff to reject physicians for privileges who have a record of poor care or breaches of ethics. This was very important to the college because it hoped to have only competent and ethical physicians as fellows and wanted to impose this standard on the medical staffs of hospitals, many of whom were performing surgery but had no training in surgery. The medical staff was required to have rules, regulations, and policies for professional work. For example, a rule that all patients had to have a history and physical ta uh, history taken and a physical examination within 24 hours of admission, or a rule that all uh, tissue removed of surgery had to be examined by a pathologist. These rules established the processes through which patients were cared for in a hospital, an important element in the patients in the nation's health care system. The monthly medical staff meetings used to analyze patient care and by using medical records was the beginning of outcomes research and the measurement of quality of care. The mortality morbidity conference in surgery flowed from this requirement. Every patient must have a medical record. Elementary now, but a new concept 100 years ago. The original written mandate for this requirement was accompanied by a set of forms on which physicians could record their histories and physical examinations. And the college notified hospitals that these forms were available for purchase by hospitals from a vendor in Chicago. Hospitals eagerly bought these forms for their medical staffs to use. By determining what was on the forms, the college was specifying all the elements of an optimal physical, physical examination in history. This established the practice of history taking and physical examination that has been taught to medical students for 100 years. Later requirements led to an expansion of the medical record. Medical records needed to be stored. The medical records, were, med, the re, medical records rooms were staffed by medical records librarians. This led to medical record librarian education and training programs, and eventually the college developed an organization to certify them. Obviously, these records were important for caring for the patient on subsequent visits, or sometimes an illness treated as an outpatient, but the college emphasized that the records should be kept for research purposes. Thus, catalog cataloging systems were set up so that records could be identified by certain ca patient characteristics, such as female gender, diseases such as diabetes, and operations such as cholecystectomy. The college concept was that, that the purpose of keeping these records was to conduct research on diseases and operations. So investigators would have the medical record pulled of all the charts of patients who had lower extremity amputations during the past five years and laboriously review them for infection or non-healing and then relate these complications to age, smoking history, and a variety of other factors that may or may not have been important. The era created by the college, where medical records are kept in a specified place in a hospital and later in doctor's offices, has been succeeded by the present era in which medical records are kept on servers. And they are created by using computers. And of course, studies using medical records are also done by computers 
using their extraordinary powers, and they are much more sophisticated, revealing, and useful in patient care. Parenthetically, the forces between, behind these two eras, the physical medical record and the server, were radically different. The first era was forced by the college, a private, not for profit organization dedicated to the competent ethical practice of surgery. The second era was forced by a mandate from the federal government, a radically different organization ostensibly dedicated to the welfare of the citizenry. The fifth standard required a clinical laboratory and, and that performed the tests, the, the clinical laboratory that performed the tests available at the time, chemical, serological, and bacteriological. But note also that histology must be available, meaning that there had to be a department of pathology. And of course, radiographic and fluoroscopic services meant that there had to be a department of radiology. Trained technicians to run these units were required, but note that no physician supervisors, such as pathologists or radiologists, were required. This is because the country had only a handful of pathologists and radiologists at the time. Remember that there were no residency programs, no ACGME, and no ABMS in 1918. The only certifying boards were ophthalmology and otolaryngology. Hiring of pathologists, radiologists, and anesthetists had to await the maturation of these specialties. The results of the hospital inspections begun in 1918 were to be announced at the Clinical Congress meeting in New York in October of 1919. But the regents were horrified when they saw the statistics. Of the 671 hospitals surveyed, only 89, or 13%, met the requirements of the minimum five standards. They decided that releasing the results would create chaos and lack of confidence on the part of the public in the health care system. And they ordered Miss Eleanor Grimm, Martin's secretary, to burn the survey documents in the hotel furnace, which she did. But the results of these surveys challenged hospital administrators to improve their institutions. They had plenty of help. The college set up a department in Chicago to give advice and help them prepare for the next round of surveys. The annual hospital standardization conferences held during the Clinical Congress featured experts who spoke on various aspects of hospital management, ranging from medical staff matters to medical record storage. Over the years, the percentage of hospital uh, approvals gradually in improved to 31% in 1919, 58% in 20, 75% by 1921. By 1935, the approval rate for hospitals with more than 100 beds was 95%, although it was much lower for hospitals with fewer than 100 beds because smaller hospitals did not have all the resources to meet the standards then in existence, such as a requirement that a stenographer record the minutes of medical staff meetings. After almost seven years at the college, John Bowman returned to academia as president of the University of Pittsburgh, and Martin was named director general of the college, a position he held for the remainder of his life. Martin hired Dr. Malcolm McEachern, a Canadian gynecologist who was superintendent of the Vancouver General Hospital as head of the hospital standardization program. In Vancouver, McEachern had implemented the five minimum standards even before they were required. He was a workaholic who traveled incessantly, advising hospitals, lecturing, and promoting the program. Later, he would write the first textbook on hospital administration, the first textbook on medical records administration, and initiate one of the first master's programs in hospital administration all during his career with the college. Some have said he was the father of hospital administration.
One consequence of having standards was that hospitals asked questions such as how to get physicians to attend medical staff meetings. Here were some suggestions provided by a speaker at a hospital standardization conference in 1921. Most of them are still germane and used today. Entice them with a meal. Give the leaders full authority. Have a sign-in sheet. Present cases briefly and have someone comment. Have the meeting run by a respected leader. The Cabot plan was to develop a differential diagnosis, then rule each potential diagnosis in or out. Create some competition. Nobody wants to have the worst medical record. The questions hospitals ask about standards often led to additional standards or detailed explanations of standards so that the number of standards gradually increased, raising more questions, which led to even more standards. Obviously, the increasing complexity of hospitals, such as the addition of specialty operating rooms, air conditioning, and anesthesia departments also helped to foster more standards. By 1926, the standards had ballooned into a manual covering 18 pages, and by 1940, it had 112 pages. Approved hospitals were given a plaque that they displayed in a prominent place. McEachran also published the names of approved hospitals in the Bulletin of the American College of Surgeons annually in an issue called the Approval Number. This public presentation of accredited hospitals brought pressure on non-accredited hospitals to seek accreditation. Each year, McEachran also organized five or six sectional meetings in medium-sized cities, such as Kansas City, Cleveland, and Birmingham, Alabama. These two-day meetings included scientific sessions for general surgeons and for eye, ear, nose, and throat physicians. Lectures were presented by visiting speakers and local fellows of the college. Members of the Committee on Fractures were present to promote the organization of local groups for improvement in the care of fractures. Eventually, these local groups became a national network of trauma committees that worked to lower the mortality and morbidity of trauma. Leaders of the Committee on Cancer came to sectional meetings to show local physicians how to organize tumor boards in their hospitals. Throughout the two days of meetings, parallel meetings on hospital standardization were held for hospital administrators in the region, featuring speakers who discussed various aspects of hospital administration. During sectional meetings, one evening was devoted to a community meeting held in the largest available venue. Without television to watch or the internet to surf, families were easily attracted to events in their communities where they gathered information and socialized with their friends. Members of the community, sometimes numbering in the thousands, came to hear famous surgeons, including George Kreil of the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Brothers, talk on subjects such as the signs and symptoms of cancer. The hospital standardization program was also explained. After community members left these meetings, they insisted that their hospitals participate in the program. McEachran and other college leaders promoted the college directly to the public, enhancing its reputation. The reputation of fellows of the college also were enhanced, which, of course, was good for business. The hospital standardization program had achieved tremendous success by the time that Franklin Martin died in 1935. He was such a dominant figure that the regents decided they never could replace him, a decision that history showed was unwise. A committee of staff members, led by McEachran, arranged the, managed the day-to-day -day affairs of the college, and George Kreil, the perpetual chairman of the Board of Regents, came to Chicago from Cleveland every week or two to provide advice. Without a leader, there were few new ideas and no new programs, and the college sort of limped along 
until World War II, when most of its leaders were occupied with the war effort or serving in the military. Clinical congresses were not held during the war, but the staff continued to have sectional meetings, now called war meetings, with speakers from the military services updating physicians on the procedures for enlistment, the activities of the Surgeon General's office as well. Lectures on how to care for war wounds and the diseases encountered during war, such as venereal disease, were also provided. The hospital standardization program languished, however, because of budget cuts. Fellows of the college did not have to pay dues during the war when they, if they were in the military, and most were. The frequency of hospital accreditation visits was also reduced. The college staff, including Malcolm McEachran, was aging. They had not had a director for 10 years. After the war, several progressive academic surgeons, including Alfred Blaylock of Johns Hopkins, Isidore Rabdon of the University of Pennsylvania, Owen Wangenstein of the University of Minnesota, and Loyal Davis of Chicago, were elected to the Board of Regents. They recognized that the college was languishing and that it needed a director to lead a revitalization. They hired former General Paul Hawley, who had been the architect of the medical care system for the Army in the European theater under General Eisenhower. He was in charge of several hundred hospitals and more than 250,000 medical personnel, including 16,000 physicians. After the war, he and General Omar Bradley led the massive expansion of Veterans Administration hospitals, adding them very wisely to academic medical centers where faculty and residents could provide the best care to the returning veterans who desperately needed it. Hawley, an experienced, no-nonsense administrator, immediately recognized that the hospital standardization program was financially unsustainable. He and the chairman of the Board of Regents, Arthur Jimmy Allen of the Massachusetts General Hospital, decided to get another organization to take it over. The American Hospital Association was anxious to have it, but the AMA reacted to this idea vociferously, believing that it would be giving hospital administrators control over physicians. After a year-long series of meetings, many of which were very contentious, Allen engineered an agreement that the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Physicians, the American Medical Association, and the American Hospital Association would form a joint commission to accredit hospitals. Thus, the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals went, in, uh, went into operation in 1951, taking over the college's hospital standardization program. The story of the hospital standardization program helps us understand what has happened to our surgery and to our profession over the past 100 years. The five minimal standards form the core of our health care system. The system was conceived and implemented by a private, not-for-profit organization of surgeons who were dedicated to the ethical and competent practice of medicine. But things have changed. Since 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid were signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson, the control of our health care system has slowly been taken away from these private organizations like the college and given over to federal and state governments. A week or so ago, we learned what our health care system will continue to look like in the near future. That system is not being forged by physicians, but by a group of politicians who have complex interactions and competing agendas. We assume that these politicians are ethical and have the interests of patients at heart but they have never been personally responsible for that sacrosanct interaction between doctor and patient in an examining room. How can we make certain that they preserve the sacredness of that space and the interaction of the people within it? Given the present paradigm, how can the college, 
which originally forged our health care system, work to assure competent ethical care for the public. My generation, now powerless and too old, hopes that you will take up that job to preserve the sanctimony of the relationships between us and our patients. Thank you very much.